Uh, Kevin Colo is a uh, graduated from the University of Wisconsin here in Madison uh, and has over 23 years of roadway design and project management experience. Since 2000, Kevin has been involved with the development of hundreds of roundabouts throughout North America, ranging from single lane roundabouts to complex three lane roundabouts. I believe today you're going to speak speak about access and roundabouts here in Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah, not only in Wisconsin, but some examples throughout the state, but a lot of pictures, a lot of examples just to go through things. Mark changed his presentation a little bit, so there'll be some redundancy now that I'll skip through, which means we get out earlier today. Um, so I won't blame Ben for that, but um, you'll, yeah, you'll see some areas where there is uh, the same information, and I'll try to go through that a little quicker and maybe spend some more time on some of the other examples that I have. but. Yes, yeah, so we'll talk about just general, more general access and what's going on out there, what people are doing, and how to look at it, and just give people some ideas if you are installing around about what you might be able to do. So with that, and again, Ben, ben covered a lot of this, but we'll, the characteristics of roundabouts do provide many benefits for access management. We do have that increased capacity. Typically, roundabouts are gonna perform better than signalized intersections. We're gonna have less queuing and delay. Um, and improved safety w with those slower speeds. And um, again, it's gonna be that more consistent speeds. You don't have people running through those red lights trying to get through the intersection. So if you're downstream of an intersection trying to make a turning movement, you're gonna have that more consistent, predictable speeds, which allows for a much safer environment for people and access points. We all, we all know this, right? We're at an access conference, so uh, they must be evaluated with site-specific criteria, the proximity to the intersection, the volumes, you know, what type of users are going in and out of there. Is it, do you need semis going in and out, or is it just, just cars? And, of course, being able to provide the appropriate site distance for drivers to make a decision to, to enter uh, into the roadway. So we'll cover quickly two, two different options, and, again, Ben covered a little bit of, of one of them with the access into the roundabout, but there's access into the roundabout and then access near the roundabout. The graphic there, again, shows a different example of, of a roundabout with uh, access coming into, into the roundabout. So when we look at access into the roundabout, it's a per preferable to avoid that if we can, and the, the reason why is it does introduce conflicts into the circulatory roadway. So you think about the driver that is turning into that driveway needing to slow down, make that right turn, and get in there. So people in a roundabout aren't really anticipating someone slowing down when they're in there, and that's one of the things. And then someone coming out of the driveway needs to accelerate and get out, get out of the intersection. And traditional driveways with an apron coming into the roundabout really don't have that um, island that discourages somebody from making the left turn. Now, the, typically, if we are doing this, it's going to be a driveway with a repeat driver, so they're going to know how to do that and to stay to the right of the central island. But, but there is that um, they do not have the ability to really discourage that. So we'll, we'll look at driveways into the circulatory roadway if there's really no alternative, if the volumes are low. Um, this is, is an important one, is you really want to make sure that they can face into the circle, that they don't have to back into the roundabout and then, and then get out of there. So hopefully within their sight, they have the ability to turn around and enter in uh, facing the center island. And of course, that, that site again. And with, with this type of one, if it is truly just a, a driveway coming in there, we want to provide clear visual indication that it is a private driveway. And here's an example. What I mean by that is you know, maintaining the curb line, bringing it through around the circulatory roadway, and then having a more of a just a standard driveway apron going through there. You can see the sidewalk carries through. So for for the drivers, they see it as a driveway and not necessarily another leg. So there's really no desire to go up that that particular direction. And here's another another example again of a, a nicely done driveway up here with a connection. So somebody coming really unless they're interested, aren't, aren't going to go down that way. It's really not a natural movement for them. So I've, I've got an example here in uh, De Pere, Wisconsin, which is northeast of here up by, by Green Bay, where we have a uh, single lane roundabout in this, in this northwest area is a, a fire station. And their circulation within their site is all the vehicles come in one way, they go through, and then they exit out in this direction. So with this particular roundabout, if we take a, 
a closer look at the apron, you can see that it's widened out to provide them the access into the circle so they can make the right turn if they wanted to head to the west. And then you can see that they also have access right into the circulatory roadway, which allows them to go to the north, to the east, as well as to the south. And in order to do that, you can see the fire station up here, the ambulance. Um, this island was just shaved back a little bit, which provides them, um, again, access. So what's a little unique or challenging is you can see there's also a pedestrian crossing right in the middle here. So there's a little differentiation here with the crosswalk going through there. But I, I don't think someone in an ambulance is going to run over a pedestrian standing there, hopefully. So it really um, has turned out to be in a, a safe, safe location. This was actually one of the sites that Ben had shown in, in Nina, again, with if now you're getting into the larger volume driveway. So they're treating it more as another leg to the roundabout and not just a driveway. You can see all the parking area coming in. And then there's the introduction of the splitter island and the crosswalk area, the pedestrian refuge area. So you're really just treating them as another leg into the roundabout. Another example, this one also up in the Green Bay area where there's a casino and a hotel and a much you know, larger parking, so higher volume. So again, treating that as a, a leg into it. And actually on the, on the south side of the picture is the access into the, the Green Bay Airport, again, being treated as a leg. Anybody see a turtle anywhere? Yeah. So it's just interesting. I always like it's it's cool, you know. You don't work on many projects where you can do fun fun landscaping, but as part of a, a Native American area with the the Oneidas, and that was their um, symbol as the turtle. So as part of that, it was introduced into the landscaping. So there's a a series of them with with different turtles along the way. It's unfortunate because when you're driving through it, you really don't notice it, but when you have the aerial view, you can really see how that looks. You just kind of see what's this green thing sticking out here and there, but it's it's pretty cool. Here's one not in Wisconsin, uh, over in the Pebble Beach, California area, where they've got a unique one. Again, this is going to be access into a roundabout, but maybe if we just walk through there, it's kind of unique. We've got the freeway here. You have the overpass. You have an off-ramp, and then you have an on-ramp. But within this on-ramp is access into the Pebble Beach golf area, and there's actually you know, a movement coming out and I have some animation. So you're coming through this one leg and you have the choice to go down onto the freeway or turn right and head in there. And then if you're coming out, you can make the right and head onto the freeway or make the left. So as you can imagine, it's, it's kind of confusing and a lot going on. And here's the actual uh, access coming in. So it's kind of in the middle of this interchange area, which is which unique and, and different. And this is the solution with the, with the roundabout that was installed. So really the same, the same configuration and the vehicle exiting has the choice of to go on, go on to the ramp or to make that right turn. You can see some chicaning was introduced in here to keep those speeds low so that the vehicle that is exiting out of here, it's a more predictable, slower speed going through there. And it's almost a little teardrop mini type of roundabout that allows them to come back and access the roundabout as a normal leg. So really unique, nice solution at that location. So now we'll, we were just talking about access into the roundabout. We'll look at access near the roundabout. And you know, again, Ben covered a lot of this, but generally less restri restrictive than signalized intersections. We've got that reduced speed in the queuing. And this allows us to have full access drivers closer to the roundabout than any other, than other type of intersections can control. We don't have the left turn lanes, the right turn lanes, where you know, you've got to keep them out of it, out of those areas when you can. Roundabouts, we do have the ability to put in the splitter island, which can restrict uh, access points to right in and right out only. And typically, we do not want to have <coughs> a driveway between the crosswalk and the yield line. So really close to the entrance to the roundabout. That's typical, what you don't, don't want to do. But your, your full access driveways are going to be governed by a number of factors, as you can imagine, the volume, the space, the capacity. So when you, when you look at the capacity of the driveway, uh, typically they're going to be looked at as an unsignalized capacity analysis with that random distributed traffic. Again, the no platooning that's going through there. So it's, it's pr fairly random. And you may have less capacity and more delay than downstream from the signal. Ben covered that a little bit. Um, so many times we've been involved, both of us have been involved with, with some simulations where you take a look at it. And what, what are the impacts of that driveway from the, from the signal alternative as well as the roundabout alternative? And you can kind of show that through, through VISM simulation. 
and of course the site distance. Ben showed this particular one, which is some of the guidance that is out there in the NCHRP, but I say that's desirable, but not always practical. You can't really do that, so I, I agree with Ben that some more guidance would be, would be good. Now we'll get into some pictures and just look at different alternatives that are out there. And one of the things I said was that you don't want to have a driveway between the crosswalk and the yield line, but the first sl slide or picture I show is that, where we have a driveway right, right here with the, within the splitter island. Here's the crosswalk. What was done with this one was that the crosswalk was set back a little bit. Typically that's 20 feet from the yield line to allow one vehicle to store in here, but it was actually pushed, pushed a little bit further away. <coughs> to allow that driveway to come in, which is a right in, right out. You can see the, the raised island, which is restricting that, and then the driveway right in here. So lower volume, not a, not a state road necessarily, but um, more of a local urban, urban type of roundabout with lower volume, so you can get away with a, a little bit more. Uh, you can imagine if there's queuing and delay, you know, you just have to uh, let somebody allow you to get into the roundabout. But again, it's a much slower environment at that location. The other thing you don't want to do is you typically don't want to have your driveways right where a crosswalk is, and that's what this next slide is, where you have a, a crosswalk lined up directly with the driveway. So they're, they're kind of combining in this location. Again, a lower volume residential type of area. You can see a smaller splitter island at that location. But right, right over in here is this driveway going into it, and the crosswalk is right in that area. So the next, the next step would be where now we're going to start getting further away, away from the roundabout and you have one just, just to the east of the crosswalk, or, yep, crosswalk area, but yet still within the splitter island, allowing a vehicle to come out of the roundabout, have a little space to slide over, let vehicles get past them, low volume, residential type of location, so we can um, accommodate that differently. Again, slow speeds right in this area. I had showed this before in the northwest corner was the fire station, but on the east leg over here were also two driveways, and this is a, another treatment that, that can be used at roundabouts for accommodating that, and that's through a depressed area. So this is a, like a two-inch corrugated uh, median area where the driveways you know, have, have full access over the top of this particular area, but yet the splitter island nose is out here, so it's going to provide that pinching feeling, that slowing down that we want with the, with the, with the roundabouts. Somebody hit the sign as it's laying down there, but um, again, providing the access, but still having the benefits of the, of the roundabout there and having a splitter island that alerts the driver to slow down. Here's a similar, similar tr treatment, a little higher volume location where the splitter island was, was installed here. Uh, the reason we do that is we want to deflect people, get them a little bit to the right, swing them back in. We want speed control coming into the roundabouts. But yeah, we had all these different driveways for these uh, high volume businesses, including even a house through there. So again, this is more of that corrugated median. Drivers, you really don't want to be hitting this at a higher speed, but yet it does allow someone to slow down and, and make the, the move and turn into that. And actually, here's a, a picture of what that looks like. And you can see the, the truck here, which is waiting to get into the gas station, is actually sitting up on that, on that corrugated median. Again, just waiting to, to get into there. And then this vehicle waiting to make the left out, which would be able to drive right over that area as well. Were you involved in that design? Up in Oshkosh, yes. So why not, since those two roundabouts are so close together, why not just install a continuous media? This is on the... Can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah. The question was, why, why didn't we have just a continuous... Uh, a median installed. This happens to be the furthest east roundabout. There's four, this is the, is the eastern of four roundabouts, two at the ramp terminals and then one over to the side. So this is our far east one. But you're right, you could put in a raised median if you had, had ones in the middle. And I'll, I'll show some examples of cor corridors coming up as well. Here is a higher speed single lane roundabout. Uh, actually, Ben and I had worked on together this one. In Wisconsin, the higher the speed, typically the longer the splitter islands. We're looking to alert the driver that there's a roundabout ahead. So it's 55 miles an hour on the, on the west, north, and east legs, and then 35 on the south legs. We have these longer splitter islands, but yet we have the residential areas that needed to still have access. So there's just a slight little taper in here, a place for the driver to get out of the way. 
uh, as letting the through traffic go and then make their turns in and out with a full access. But again, you can picture what the speed is like right in this area is maybe only 25, 30 miles an hour. So it's a much different environment than sitting out here waiting for somebody to go by you going 60 miles an hour. So you can see there's another median opening up here. Then this splitter island was actually brought down a little bit to provide full access. Up there on the south leg, because of the slower speed, the splitter island doesn't need to be as long. And those two driveways are provided with full access there. And actually, there's a driveway over at this location that was removed from the state highway and put on to, well, it was always here, but we just removed one of the access points at that location. Many options, different things that can be done depending on the volume. But again, these are lower volume ones where uh, you can maybe get away with some different things than if it was a gas station, for instance, sitting at one of those locations. This is the one Ben had gone through a little bit earlier. Um, I was just going to say this is, this is a bank here and that the access movement is through there with, with all the movements and the, the removed splitter island in here, which was shorter because of the gas station. There is full full access through there, and, and yeah, there's the left in, right in, right out, yet they still have full access. On the far east end here, you can see the median is short, and then there's a left turn lane that gets into this access point that allows full, full access for that, those businesses in, in that area. So now we're going in even higher, bigger volumes with the three-lane roundabout up, up in the Green Bay area. With um, This one actually had gas stations in all three corners. We're going to focus in on the southeast area with a smaller splitter island here that allows the vehicle to have full access in here. So believe it or not, when you have gas stations some, in access control, it gets political sometimes. So you have to do the best you can, right? So trying to restrict access and put it on the minor road. This is more of the major road going east and west was the compromise uh, with the gas station. Again, slower speeds at that location, the ability for someone to move into the other lane to get past somebody waiting to turn in there. We were able to restrict this access point with the, with the raised median or the splitter island, but this access point, these two actually do have full access as well as one to the north. There's a little bit of a splitter island out, out in this area, and again, we want to alert the driver, get him over, swing him over. And so there is refuge in this area for a vehicle, a turning vehicle, to sit in there to, to make their turning movements. This one I, I, I like. I just want to show with the, what a gas station on the corner looks like where you've got your main road, restricting this one to right in, right out a nice little island that helps guide the vehicles and then providing the full access on more of the, on the minor road. So really nice access control at that location. Then the next, the next step would be here again as a bank with a roundabout. You can see there's a raised splitter islands and medians the entire way, but with, with two full access, or I should say with two right in, right out, Oh, so you have full access for, for this bank, again, with the ability to, to do the U-turn and turn in, and then to be able to come out and go in any different, any different direction. So really nice access control in the corner of a roundabout with two right in and right out driveways. In addition to that, you can see on the east leg, um, just some different access control with the shorter splitter islands in there, allowing the full access, restricting the bar in this corner to a right in and right out only as well. Uh, the picture is, is the example that Ben had. And when we talk about <coughs> roundabout corridors and the U-turns that we've talked about for sure, and then connecting them, being able to restrict the left in, left out, which is where our, our safety and also providing the capacity of the corridor, <coughs> being able to have less lanes and a safer corridor. Uh, so these, these type of uh, treatments are very useful and powerful. Here's, here's a good example down on uh, Pleasant Prairie. So it's uh, south. <coughs> south of Milwaukee, north of Chicago, still in, still in Wisconsin. Uh, you can see an, a number of residential driveways all coming out into this, this roadway, two, two intersections. This particular roadway was a two-lane rural roadway that needed to be expanded to four lanes. It was decided that it was going to become an urban expansion. A study was completed for both the intersections, looking at signals as well as roundabouts. One of the big things on this particular pro or project was a raised median. So if these were going to be signals, we'd be looking at approximately a 30-foot median to allow for left turn lanes and offset lefts, things like that, along this corridor. But if we were looking at roundabouts where we don't have the left turns, we can get by with a much 
narrower median going through there. And then, of course, the ability to, to be able to make U-turns. This was going to have a raised median no matter what. So when you go out to the public and you're meeting with them, you can have you know, a wider median or a narrower median, have easier U-turns. Um, so it was, it was a process to go through. But um, in the end, as you can imagine, it turned into two, two roundabouts, multi-lane roundabouts. The skew over here, anytime we can square up the roundabout, improve, improve the geometrics. We try to do that, but um, multi-lane roundabouts with a four-lane section in between here with a the, with the narrow median. So here's what that narrow median looks like. Um, the narrower gutter and, and six feet from face to face allows for signs to be, to be placed in there. But when, you're, when we were meeting with the, with the public and the ability to save 10 feet of their front yard, right, and then still have better access, better speeds going through there, the ability to do U-turns, there were many reasons that the roundabouts were selected as as the preferred alternative through here. So if we look a little bit closer at each one of the intersections, the, the one on the west, uh, each one has their own little driveway access point things on the south one here, providing full access for residential. The one on the north, you can tell that the old road used to be right in here. This driveway was relocated and brought up here at a spot where they could have full access and then have better sight through there. Five minutes already, well. Wow. Okay, and then, uh, then there's a wider median up on the north leg that allows for the, for the left turns. There's actually left turn lanes through there. And then on the south leg, uh, we did go ahead and restrict that with the, with the raised median. So again, all sorts of different treatments on this one project in addition to the corridor, uh, restricting everybody to right in, right outs as well. The Sedona example uh, Ben had covered, you know, just these driveways again on the south and the other one in the middle there. I'll go through these quickly. One out in California where it's single lane uh, connecting with some smaller roundabouts. But just the different feel in the environment than what if that was a three lane section or what if it was a four lane undivided, how, how that looks and how it would operate. All the driveways such as this becoming right in, right out. But landscaping, a real different feel and environment, slower speed, a real nice location. One in Minnesota bigger signalized intersections here, but then a corridor connecting in between and all the access points are coming out, coming out into roundabouts. And again, you can see a, a different environment to, with a nice landscaped area and what the, what the roundabout looks like through there. So good treatments for, for access control are the corridors. And then Ben, ben went through the, the Golden Colorado example. I'll just mention that you know that their sales revenues did increase once this was done, but they do have some median left turn openings in the middle. And if I recall from the looking at this, is if traffic got or if there are safety issues or things, they have the ability to come in and restrict that then, and pull out those uh, full access points and, and restrict those a little bit more through through the roundabouts. So with that, any questions? Just trying to give some examples and some pictures of of different alternatives. Yeah. You have uh, use the red color for the median. Is that MUTCD or is it just Wisconsin practice? I would say it's 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 definitely Wisconsin, but there's a lot of other states. This is an example of Wisconsin, right, with the red. So the truck apron for sure is red. Um, whether it's red in the Splitter Islands, many cities might use something different, but that's pretty consistent within Wisconsin <coughs> using that red federal color. That is Can consistent. I ask one more small question for the access point. You have, I see you have a lot of the very close access point. To me, the closer, the safer, right, is that the vehicle speed is slower. I don't know, it's, it's not like an interchange of RAM. You, get, you have to be like a certain distance away. I know next presentation is going to talk about a safety benefit. <laughs> I'm yeah. just curious, it's, it looks to me closer the better. The safer, slower. Slow, it is slower the closer you get, yeah. It depends, you know, the volumes and the vehicles and the queuing, and there's so many different factors that go into it to say one is safer over the other. I don't know that I could say that, but you are absolutely right. The slower, the closer you are, the slower it will be at that location. Yep. Yeah. So my question was where you have residential accesses very close in to the roundabout, yeah. uh, let's say within or close to the pedestrian crossing, did you make accommodation? at those properties for people to turn around so they weren't backing out or was the volume low enough that you let people back out into the 
roadway? The, um, for, you're talking about when they're coming right into the roundabout? Uh, let's say you had a residential driveway just outside of the pedestrian crossing on one of your entry legs. Yeah, kitty corner from the fire station. Oh, sure. Well, let's just go back to that example quick. Um, did those have X? No, those would be allowed. I, th I think this one did not have, well, we can do the aerial. Yeah, this one, maybe they could turn around in. But again, it's a much slower environment. So these, I think, were where they would <laughs> potentially back into it. But they're not backing into the roundabout. They're backing into the road. Really no different than any other driveway along the, any sort of roadway. The benefit here is that it will be slower coming at them as they're getting in and out. So much more predictable uh, location to get in and out of your driveway. Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah. I'm curious, in the Pleasant Prairie example, yeah. the, the central circles weren't exactly circular. And I, in the Pleasant Prairie example, the, the central circles aren't precisely circular and I'm wondering to what extent to what extent they can be distorted or oblong for example and still function or is it really important to keep that consistent turning radius for the vehicles in the roundabout yeah they're typically they're circular which is fine there may be locations especially on skewed intersections where you may get non-circular the one the one on the left here is circular the one on the right is not, and that's because it includes a spiral. So a spiral is any time we have an exclusive left turning lane and we have to direct a vehicle into an outer lane going through there. So that's when you get into, it's not only, I guess it's still circular, but it's not consistent and it, it is spiraling them, them out. But there are many examples of non-circular roundabouts out there as well. I was just curious as to if there were any guidelines or criteria for um, providing illumination at the roundabouts in the Wisconsin maybe area. Yeah, if it's, if it's on the state, state system, it will be lit. That is the requirement in Wisconsin. And many counties follow that, although there are some that aren't lit out there. Um, ben, I, don't, I know there's a couple that we had worked on that maybe aren't lit. But yeah. if it's on the state system, it will be lit. And it will be lit before it opens Ideally, it will be lit, assuming all the light fixtures have come in and are ready to be installed, will be lit before it opens up into our circular movement. We want to have the lighting, the signing, everything opening and operational when we, when we let them go into that circular motion. So yeah, lighting is an important component, especially at the higher speed locations. The signing, the marking, the lighting, they all work together to slow those vehicles down as they're approaching the roundabout. Yeah. Uh, be concerned about access. I, th I think we're skipping one issue when we talk about driveways near a roundabout and the question is proof of necessity why even give them a driveway so always the first question has to be is there an alternative to give them a driveway and then like in a retrofit situation a lot of your slides are retrofit yeah, yeah. they're already there they've got the garage you're going to connect them right but I just want I don't want to miss the point that just because we put out recommendations on where driveways could be and survive and how they might look like and, and actually operate doesn't mean we support allowing the access it's just if you have to these are good ideas to solve your problem yeah I, th I think that's a great point these are just examples of what others have done in your many locations remove it move it do whatever you can first before you're allowing those access points great okay comment. Uh, thank you uh, I think we'll move on to our next speaker thank you.